Thank you, Ana Maria. Um, yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me in this uh, talk uh, about uh, Kotlin coroutines and how to make concurrency uh, easy with it. Um, just uh, a bit of context, who I am. Um, I'm Ricardo Lipolis. I'm a Java developer um, from Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, we've been working for JDriven for about, well, uh, many years now. Uh, <laughs> Um, yes, the J stands for Java, but we've evolved beyond that. Um, I've been doing Kotlin for about three years now, um, more than three years, and giving talks about it um, in different conferences, also about reactive programming. Um, and well, on my project, started using coroutines uh, because I was using Kotlin and wanted to use all the cool features. Uh, I found out in the beginning that I was using coroutines in the wrong way. Um, so I decided, okay, maybe I should take a step back and see, okay, what's actually the concept behind coroutines and how to apply them correctly. And I hope by giving this talk that I will help you guys in skipping a few steps, um, the, you know, preventing you from making errors I made and um, being able to apply Kotlin coroutines in uh, the right way. So let's start. Uh, with a definition, what's a coroutine? Um, well, there's a nice definition for it, um, which uh, involves non-preemptive multitasking. Uh, when I read this, I think, well, why would I want that? What, uh, what is it and what can I do with it? Uh, and it's um, about suspending and resuming functions. So, well, as a traditional Java or Kotlin developer, you think, okay, if I call a function, uh, basically I block until the function returns. Um, how do I uh, get the possibility to suspend and resume functions? It's uh, um, something, if you come from the traditional Java world, it's uh, not, um, yeah, um, impossible to, to think about. How, how, how do we do that? So let's start with non-preemptive multitasking. Again, a definition, don't worry, it's not all going to be definitions today. Um, well, but non-preemptive multitasking is basically about preventing context switches and the statement here describes processes but the same applies to uh, threads for example in an application uh, so basically it says never but you try to minimize switching thread context um, by having the, the the code that's running on the threads voluntarily yield control uh, periodically or when uh, yeah there's something blocking going on so basically it's um, multitasking without unnecessary con uh, threat context switching because everybody has manners. And to give a real life example of this, imagine you have this single lane road. Um, typically only one car can pass at a time, but because you have these, these passing lanes on the side and um, yeah, people park, uh, put their car there, it's possible to have well traffic in both directions, even though there's only one road. So you can see, uh, basically this road as one thread and you can still have multiple uh, tasks running on that thread because, well, occasionally one of the tasks will voluntarily yield control to another task. So to give a, an example, um, traditionally when you talk about doing um, multiple things at the same time, you can think, oh, it's, it's like cooking, you know, you, have, you can um, cook a dish by yourself, but you do multiple things at the same time. Of course, you can also cook uh, with multiple uh, people, but uh, for now, let's uh, focus on being one person who cooks pasta. Um, I'm a half Italian, so of course I chose uh, a pasta dish. And what I have here is a function that basically gives a very uh, basic recipe for cooking pasta. And Italians are traditionally a bit um, strict about their uh, pasta recipes, well, actually about everything involving food and drinks. Um, but so I hope I, by keeping the recipe simple, I don't uh, offend any uh, other Italians. Um, and of course, one thing you don't want to use is ketchup in a, a pasta dish, um, not even when it's a Kotlin ketchup, which is an actual brand in, uh, in Poland uh, for ketchup. And I hear it's uh, pretty good as well. But we're not going to use ketchup today. So the basic recipe involves a few steps that need to be performed to be able to cook the pasta. So it's like boiling water, cutting some vegetables. I kept it uh, vegetarian today. 
um, preparing the sauce, uh, putting salt in the water, boiling the pasta, and then in the end, you put everything together and you serve the dish. So I've color coded these these lines to give an indication to, well, to later I'll show you why I did that. Um, and the implementation is kept pretty simple for now, just a thread dot sleep for a number of seconds. Of course, in reality, it's more than seconds, but just to um, make it runnable uh, in a pretty uh, fast way, I've used seconds. Um, so it's sort of like a blocking uh, action that takes place here. Of course, a sleeping thread is not a working thread, but for the sake of example, imagine that something is happening uh, during a certain time. So if you look at the, uh, the recipe, you can already see that some parts of the recipe belong more together than other parts. So for example, here you have the boiling water and the uh, adding salt and cooking the pasta. And then the other end, you have the cutting of the vegetables and preparing of the sauce. And typically when you're um, executing this recipe, you would do both tasks simultaneously. But seeing as we're just having a traditional uh, single threaded function, and we execute all these steps after each other, we cannot really um, group these together. The only thing is we know that in the end, when everything is done, we can serve the dish and it's ready. So if we execute this, this would be the, the, the logging output. Um, you can see that the total runtime for now is 35 seconds. Of course, in reality, I'm not that fast. Um, but it's just an indication of a, a time that uh, the whole thing took place. And you can imagine every step had its own uh, thread.sleep uh, delay. And well, I noticed, uh, I talked about the colors earlier. You can see that the, the colors of the, the actions being performed are all uh, sequentially after each other. You can see them in the log files. And this is pretty much what we expect, right? I mean, you execute sequentially on a single thread and well, it's being executed. Uh, after each other. So what if we want to do this with coroutines? Mm, don't focus too much on the, the specific syntax now. Uh, it's just an indication of how to do that, but I will give uh, also some uh, uh, variety in that and how to uh, execute it. So first off, you see a couple of new uh, terms like suspend and coroutine scope. I will explain these later. Um, but to give an indication that the, the way the functions are implemented, is instead of using thread.sleep, I use an action called delay. And that's a, a part of the coroutines library, which is basically um, a non-blocking way of delaying your function. And I'll explain more later about it. But it's different than thread.sleep in that it does not block. And what we see here is that the, the actions that belong together, we can group them together into a, an asynchronous block. So cooking the pasta is one uh, asynchronous block. Uh, preparing the sauce is a second block. And in the end, we await all of these things to be done and we serve the dish. So let's execute this one. Now we see that the runtime, instead of 35 seconds, is 20 seconds. And what's interesting is that the, the different uh, steps we take are intertwined together all uh, in, um, yeah. Well, and you see all the colors are like mixed uh, instead of uh, being sequential. So uh, you have the, the, the cooking of the pasta, the preparing of the sauce, and in the end, we serve the sauce. But what's interesting here, and what, what blew my mind, is that it was all executed on the main thread. Like main, what's that there? That's the name of the thread that we call the function on. And it's all single threaded. So how does it mix? I mean, that was like mind blowing for me. Like what, what's going on here? So that's where the concept of suspending functions uh, come into uh, play. So like I said before, a suspending function can be paused and resumed and they can execute operation without blocking. So you can uh, create a suspending function and from a suspending function, you can call other suspending functions. And basically uh, what happens is that there, the suspend keyword is used in the Kotlin language to transform your function into a function that can be uh, suspended and resumed. 
So the Kotlin coroutines library is, like I say, a library. It only has yeah, like uh, additional um, yeah, uh, classes uh, in the in 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 the jar that can be supplied in application. But there's one uh, keyword added to the Kotlin language to support coroutines, and that's the suspend keyword. All the other stuff involving Kotlin coroutines is all in the library. There's only one keyword added. And the reason that keyword is needed is because this function, when converted to JVM bytecode, is basically transformed, chopped up into pieces, where every um, piece of your code up until the next suspension point is a, a separate um, part, is like separated in, into a sort of a state machine, you can say. And between those uh, different uh, states in the state machine, this, the current state of your function is being stored and uh, restored later on. So every time you call a suspending function, that's a point where the application or the, the, the coroutines library might say, okay, we stop uh, executing here and we give the control to another coroutine to continue. So the delay function we mentioned earlier, um, that's a, an example of a, a suspending function, which says, okay, well, at least for 100 milliseconds, I want to delay my function. And I say at least because it's like with traditional threading, um, it's a, an indication that you want to uh, suspend for a given time. But of course, when you want to resume and there are no resources for you to resume on, it might take longer. But traditionally, if you have enough resources, then it means, okay, delay for 100 milliseconds. Uh, there's a yield uh, function that just says, okay, for now, this is a step where I might yield to another coroutine, but if, if not needed, I can continue. And if you're calling another suspending function, which you designed yourself, or maybe it's in another library, that's also a point where your function might suspend. So again, cooking pasta, what actually happened is when the boil water function was called and it called the delay, basically it was running on the main thread, but the coroutines library said, okay, you want to delay here? Fine. In this case, I can continue with executing the cut vegetables uh, function. And of course that also had a delay. So in the end, all the tasks were basically yielding to each other. And well, basically the first one that uh, was uh, ready to be resumed could actually be resumed. So I've talked about the suspend part. Um, now I'm gonna talk a bit about coroutine scope um, and to explain what's going on there, I need to discuss the concept of structured concurrency. So like I said before, I don't wanna like, throw all these definitions at you and especially the structured concurrency one is like, yeah, so long. So I'll give you the, the shorter version. Basically structured concurrency means you can structure your concurrency using imperative program flow. So consider uh, for loops, uh, if then else, um, uh, while loops, uh, calling one function from another. Basically the way you're already used to program, just traditional imperative program flow, in that way, um, those th that structure can be used to define how to execute tasks concurrently. Uh, and you get some guarantees from that. For example, that when you're calling a uh, function uh, B from function A and function B does something asynchronously, uh, so fans out some operation, you can gar uh, guarantee that all of these asynchronous operations are finished before function B is finished and returns control to function A. So you can uh, reason about your concurrency uh, easily because you can just read the code and see the, the, the order of your code, which defines the order of the th task that you want to uh, execute. If there's an error in one of the child jobs, and I use the term jobs here, but that's basically well, uh, somewhere deep inside your nested functions, uh, that gets propagated back to the parents so that if there are any other running uh, child jobs, they can be canceled. Um, imagine if you would, uh, do this in a traditional executor uh, style when you have an executor service and you submit multiple jobs and then one of the jobs fails, which basically means you cannot give a, a full response, then, then in that case, you would need to cancel all the other jobs yourself or just let them run and ignore the result. But of course, that's a waste of resources. So uh, 
using the structured concurrency style in uh, Kotlin coroutines gives you the guarantee that you don't have to have to do all the cleanup, which is nice. So if we would write the pasta uh, recipe in a different way, more in a structured concurrency way, what would that look like? So the, the steps that we've defined that belong together, we can group them together in a function. So we have a prepare pasta function, which contains all the tasks needed to prepare the pasta and the make sauce function that well, makes the sauce. And we can uh, create a coroutine scope function. Uh, in this case, a coroutine scope is a sort of a builder method uh, supplied by the Kotlin coroutines library to be able to use uh, things such as launch and async that we saw before. So they give you some extra uh, functions to be able to do stuff asynchronously. And in this case, we use launch, which basically is, is the same as async, but doesn't have a return value. So async provides you sort of a uh, like a future, uh, so a possible result in the future. And launch is just, okay, execute this asynchronously. And uh, I just want to, uh, I don't care about the return value. Um, but we can say, okay, the prepare dish function is a coroutine scope in which we asynchronously prepare the pasta and we make the sauce. And when that is done, we call the serve dish. So reading this code, you can already, um, reason about the order in which everything is going to be done. But still, you have asynchronous functionality, which is nice. So I've talked about error propagation. Uh, what if during uh, the boiling of the pasta, something would happen? Uh, some exception, you know, just a traditional Java exception or error, uh, which we all handle on a daily basis uh, in our, on our jobs? What would happen? Well, like I explained, um, it propagates back to the parent. And because we were running on the main thread here, well, there's just uh, an exception on the main thread where we get our uh, illegal state exception. And we also see in the stack trace that the, it's actually uh, at our uh, function that we uh, were calling. You do see some other stuff uh, in the stack trace, like the invoke suspend you see here. And of course, that's what I exp explained before. That's the JVM bytecode that's generated to be able to uh, make your function suspending. Uh, but you can simply navigate to the point in your code where the exception occurred. And uh, at the same time, we were started, we started cutting the vegetables, but that gets finished and we can focus on the, the fire going on here, which uh, I think, uh, yeah, deserves our attention. So, so far, we've only focused on uh, being single threaded, but of course, you know, using the power of our uh, CPUs, we want to use all the, the resources available. So can we also do multi-threading? Well, of course. So to explain how to uh, do stuff multi-threaded, I want to talk about the concept of coroutine context. So every coroutine is executed within a certain context. And the context is, of course, a pretty uh, vague term. It's a, but you can imagine it as being just a map with some key value pairs, which is available to you uh, while executing the coroutine. So if you're used to uh, programming in Spring, you have, some, you have a, a security context or a request context, which is available to you because it's put in a thread local. Um, well, because coroutines don't really map to individual threads, it's not the same, but the concept is the same. You're running your code, and in, uh, at the same time, there's a, a context available for you where there's some information that's needed. So you can um, add your own context elements to the context, and the element is basically the key in the map of key value pairs. Um, for example, if you use uh, some logging framework, you can add some MDC context so that you can expand your logging with some uh, extra elements. Um, if you're doing something with security, you can uh, have a security context element, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But there are also a number of default elements used by the Kotlin coroutines library. And one of these elements is the coroutine dispatcher. So a dispatcher, you can uh, see like uh, it, it's a sort of like like a, a, a could be a thread pool um, or it could be single threaded. So it's basically uh, a way of determining on which thread or threads your coroutines are executed. 
So if you call a child coroutine from a parent coroutine, or well, because we're using structured concurrency, that basically means calling one suspended function from another suspended function, um, the co uh, coroutine context gets inherited by the child coroutine. So if you call function uh, B from function A, and function A has a certain context, function B also has that same context. However, you can modify it for yourself and for your children. So that if function B modifies the context, the context for A is unmodified, but if B calls C, then of course C has the context of B, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like a tree structure. So if you want to uh, well, execute the, the uh, asynchronous tasks uh, also uh, on uh, multiple threads, what would that look like? Well, there's the with context function, uh, part of the coroutines library, which enables us to specify a dispatcher. So when, when I saw this for the first time, there were two things that were confusing me. So first of all, it says dispatchers.default. So why should I specify something that's default, right? Well, actually, uh, because it is a default dispatcher that's available to you by default, but it's not the one that's by default being used in the coroutine context. And I'll explain later uh, what the default uh, would actually be then, but um, just think that it is a, a default dispatcher to use, but it's not always used by default. And the second thing that confused me is that the function was called with context. So you think, okay, do I have to pass in a context to the function? And then you specify a dispatcher. So a dispatcher is a context element but um, basically to be able to easily uh, expand your coroutine context with a certain element, this is sort of like a, a helper function to just say, okay, I want to enrich my context with the default dispatcher. So yeah, we're basically um, expanding the context of the prepare dish uh, coroutine with the default dispatcher. Um, and the prepare dish function is called from the cook costa function as before. So if we execute this, uh, you can see that instead of everything being done on the main thread, there are some worker threads where everything's being executed. So we have the, the preparing of the pasta, which is executed on the worker thread two. And we have the cutting of the vegetables and preparing of the sauce, which is executed on work thread three, mostly. Some of you might know this, that it's not always three. And we have the serving pasta well, on the main uh, uh, thread again. And like I said before, uh, that's the idea of uh, the child uh, coroutines uh, modifying the context, but not for the parents. So the parent coroutine context, like I said before, um, is the cook pasta function, which is executed on the main thread. And the prepare dish function is called from the cook pasta, but that has a separate context which is executed multi-threaded. So you can see that the context is not inherited by the parent, uh, but it still uses its own context. But what's a bit strange maybe is that you can see that both the pasta is ready and sauce is ready uh, log message are executed by, uh, are printed by worker thread two. So the functions that we executing are not confined to a single thread. And that's something to take into account. So be careful when you're using uh, thread locals, because basically you should not be able to guarantee the thread on which your coroutine is executing. Of course, unless you're executing everything single threaded, but to be able to prevent uh, very weird errors, don't assume that your coroutine runs on a certain thread. Every time a coroutine suspends, and it um, uh, resumes later on, that might be on the same thread, but it might necessarily also be another thread. So don't assume which thread you're working on. Basically, when there's a, a worker thread available that's running and it's uh, coming up to a suspension point, then it uh, immediately tries to pick up another coroutine to resume. Um, that's basically the, the, the preventing of context switching I mentioned earlier. The coroutine worker threads, they just want to keep on um, working uh, on the, the, the coroutines that are available to uh, resume. So there are a number of diff, uh, default uh, dispatcher types available. Uh, like mentioned before, uh, the dispatchers.default 
you can compare that one to the, the fork join pool in Java. It's a, a shared thread pool, application-wide uh, shared, which is based on the number of CPU cores you have. Um, so it scales with uh, yeah, the, the environment on which it runs. And you can use that for um, yeah, calculation stuff, uh, everything that needs to be, um, um, yeah, that, that needs some CPU time to, uh, to process. You have an IO dispatchers. Um, because, well, I mean, we uh, obviously want non-blocking I.O., but in reality, we know that, well, there are a lot of cases in which we cannot prevent uh, blocking I.O. tasks. Um, so to be able to make sure that it, these blocking I.O. tasks don't block the rest of your applications, there's this I.O. dispatcher pool of threads that can grow uh, pretty large. But because they're all uh, basically sleeping threads, they should not uh, use too much resources other than the fact that uh, a thread takes up a resource. But because it's a shared pool, you can easily offload it to that shared pool. So that's basically a managed pool of sleeping threads. Uh, there's a, a main dispatcher, which basically only applies when you're uh, doing UI development on Kotlin. Um, so like Android, JavaFX, Swing. Uh, People who are working with that know that when you want to update the UI, change some text, whatever, a button, uh, it has to be done on the main UI thread. And, and yeah, of course, because you're using coroutines, you, you're not really interested in threading. So there's a main dispatcher which makes sure that if you execute something, um, you can just, uh, that updates the, the UI, you can just say with context dispatches.main and you specify um, the thing you want to update on the on the, on the UI, and what's nice about this is you can uh, in the main dispatcher you can await a result from some uh, I/O task that's sleeping on the I/O dispatcher, because well a suspending function that awaits uh, a non-blocking result from another suspending function, well it suspends. So even though you're calling an await function within the main dispatcher, it will suspend and not sleep. So it will not block the UI thread. So it's a really nice way of uh, yeah, doing multi-threading without uh, causing uh, delays in your UI. Uh, it's also possible to just create a Java executor or executor service and use that as a coroutine dispatcher. So you can do your own management, uh, thread management, say, okay, I want to be able to run these coroutines on, well, maximum four threads or whatever uh, you need. There's a, a helper method to convert a Java executor into a coroutines dispatcher. So, so far we've talked about, well, you can call a suspending function from another suspending function and well, coroutines are executed within a coroutine context. So, so how, how do we start? How do we get from the, well, the traditional part that we're used to, to the, the suspended uh, part of uh, Kotlin coroutines? There are a number of ways. Uh, first of all, there's a thing called global scope, which is a globally available uh, application scoped coroutine scope. Um, this is provided to you by the, the, the Kotlin coroutines library, and it's uh, suitable for uh, one-off asynchronous tasks. Uh, this is well the only one that actually uses the dispatches.default by default, so you don't need to specify it. It's uh, an easy way to um, execute something asynchronously while you're in the traditional uh, Java uh, or Kotlin code world and you want to do something asynchronously using coroutines. However, there are some, some downsides to it. So just to give an example, say we have a, a save method which saves an entity to a repository uh, and you want to send an updated event saying, hey, this entity is updated but you don't want the save method to block while the updated event is being sent. So you could do something like this, where you say, okay, uh, repository.save, and then you call globalscope.launch, um, and in within that block, we say, okay, we sent an updated event. The globalscope.launch function returns immediately, but in the background on the dis default dispatcher, so using one of the threads from that uh, fork join pool style uh, thread pool, it will, call the send updated event function and uh, send the event. Well, of course, um, this is not ideal, you know, in terms of like 
transactionality, what if the uh, safe uh, method fails, et cetera, et cetera. I just left that out you know, it's for simplicity's sake, uh, but just to give an indication of what it would look like, of course, I wouldn't recommend this in production. Um, but there's also the fact that if the up send update event failed, you, write, you want to get notified. You want to know, okay, where, the, where did it get, get called from? Uh, why did it happen? And the thing is, because you're using global scope, basically the, 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 the stack trace, the context from which the function was called is lost because it's well uh, added to some global scope. So it's not local to the point where you called it. So in terms of error handling, uh, this is not ideal. But if for some reason you just want to do something asynchronously, you don't really mind if something goes wrong, you can just use global scope at launch. But what if you want some return data? So uh, like I said before, launch does the return value. Uh, async does have a return value. And in this case, um, well, async functions return a thing called deferred for a certain type. And deferred, you can compare that to a future uh, Java or promise in JavaScript. It basically says, okay, somewhere in the future, I might have um, some uh, data for you. So when you call a HTTP client to do an HTTP call, somewhere in the future you get a response and that response uh, is returned. Well, because the remote data is a deferred, you need to um, wait until the data is available before you can return it. But you cannot call remote data dot await there because that's a suspending function and you're not in a suspending context. So you, yeah, then uh, you can see that there's some mixture here that that's it, it doesn't work that, that nicely. So, um, well, to prevent the first thing of um, uh, losing the context when you have errors, uh, you can create your own uh, coroutine scope instead of using the global scope one. Um, a coroutine scope does need to have sort of like a life cycle. So you can, for example, bind it to the life cycle of a spring bean so that when the spring bean gets instantiated, the coroutine scope gets created, and when the spring bean is uh, uh, destroyed, then you can close the coroutine scope, which means all the asynchronous tasks running on that coroutine scope will get canceled. So you have a nice cleanup mechanism as well. And you can um, specify the dispatcher per scope, so you can easily um, yeah, control the, the, the resources you're using. So there's another way uh, to bridge uh, between uh, yeah, the, the traditional blocking world and the, the coroutine world, and that's by using run blocking, which is a method also provided by the coroutines library. Um, you can execute coroutine scoped code on the current caller thread, and the, the function will return only when it's done. That's why it's called run blocking. I can imagine that the term blocking might scare you, but basically that's what you're doing, right? You're, on a certain thread and you want to call a function and you want to wait until the function is done and it returns the value. So that's basically uh, blocking uh, a function uh, on, the, on that function call. So basically th that one doesn't use the default dispatcher, but it runs single threaded on the caller thread. So that's why in the beginning with the uh, cookie pasta recipe, when you call the cook pasta function uh, wrapped in a run blocking uh, function, then you can see that it runs on the main thread because we were calling that from the main thread. So what does that look like? Um, well, the same example where we do uh, asynchronous saving of an entity and the sending of an updated event using the run blocking uh, method. And in this case, I use the dispatcher.io dispatcher. This is an easy way to, uh, do, uh, to run that uh, on multiple threads instead of on the caller thread. Um, so the both the launch blocks will be executed um, asynchronously, where the save and the send update event will be uh, can be executed simultaneously because the I/O dispatcher has multiple threads uh, available. But the whole block, the whole save function, will only return when both of these steps are completed. And the same uh, when you want to uh, get some data from an external service, you can call the async function. Uh, you, uh, giving it the dispatcher um, where you say, okay, I want to execute this on the I.O. dispatcher because I'm doing some blocking I.O. And while that function is uh, running in the, in the background, you can do some other stuff. And then in the end, when you want to uh, get the result, you can call await. Uh, 
And because you're within that ROM blocking block, you can uh, it will suspend until the data is available. So there are also some uh, libraries and frameworks available for you already where you can basically create a fully uh, non-blocking, a full coroutine style application from start to finish without needing to convert between uh, blocking, uh, like the, the, the suspending and non-suspending functions. So for example, when you're using Spring and the, especially the reactive Spring, so like Spring Web Flux, uh, Spring uh, Data R2, D, R2 DBC, you can just simply um, well, make your annotated REST controller function suspending. So just add the suspend keyword and uh, the Spring library, the Spring Web Flux library will take care of uh, uh, all the, the whole coroutine context being the non-blocking IO um, web server that you're using. So for example, Netty or Undertow, whatever uh, app, um, yeah, layer you're using underneath, uh, if we use the non-blocking part of that framework to execute your suspending functions on. Um, and you can also uh, well, write suspending database calls. So the R2DBC which is the reactive variant of Spring Data JPA basically where you can do a JDBC uh, calls, but in a reactive way, non-blocking, and it, you can just write them as suspending functions. Uh, there's interoperability with the reactive, uh, the main reactive streams libraries like RxJava, reactive streams, uh, Project Reactor, and of course, Spring Reactive is using Project Reactor uh, under the hood. So now you see why it's easy. Uh, to also use uh, the reactive spring in combination with Kotlin coroutines is because there's nice interaction with Project Reactor. And there are some other libraries available like Ktor, which can uh, create a non-blocking HTTP server or client uh, really easily, uh, where you can be fully uh, suspending uh, without blocking. And of course, there are many other examples, but just, just to know if I, uh, that is a few. So I see that the we have about five minutes left. Um, I'll just show some quick fun uh, things you can do with coroutines. So the, the coroutines are lightweight, which is great because, um, well, imagine you want to do uh, uh, create 100,000 threads and just let them sleep for a while and then uh, print something. Well, you can see on the right that the, the memory usage uh, well, spikes pretty high. And then in the end, when the threads are done, of course, they are uh, cleaned up. And in the second example, you see the same code, but um, on coroutines. And you can see that well, the, the memory usage is, is much lower because, well, um, yeah, there's a lot less resources being needed. Of course, there are not 100,000 threads needed to execute this piece of code. So your asynchronous code, even though it spans out uh, into 100,000 tasks, it doesn't necessarily need 100,000 threads. So it's more efficient in terms of threat management. Um, Coroutines are cancelable. I, I've, known, uh, I've said it earlier. Um, you can, um, when you call uh, launch, uh, I said earlier, it doesn't have a return value. Well, actually, it returns a job instance, which links to the, the coroutine that's running, and you can cancel that one. So that means that the next time your function uh, enters a suspension point, it sees, oh, I'm being canceled, so it terminates. And that's, of course, uh, pretty awesome because, well, back in the days we had like thread.stop. I don't know if people remember that from the, the older Java era, um, which yeah led to some uh, difficulties here and there. Well, now basically you have a way of doing the same thing, but in a nice way, just cancel the next moment the code team is able to cancel. Um, yeah. so. If you're doing reactive programming, um, you're familiar with the, the concepts of uh, hot and cold observables. Um, there are some ways of doing that in uh, Kotlin coroutines as well. I'll skip them for now, seeing as I'm almost out of time. But if you're uh, creating um, a streams of data, which are, um, yeah, which have a certain time aspect to them, like events or something, you can easily use coroutines to uh, read those uh, those streams and write to those streams as well. So I've created an example project using Reactive Spring, uh, Spring Web Flux, R2B, DBC with Kotlin coroutines in between. And I'm not showing it here because, well, the code is so simple that, well, if you understand the concepts of coroutines, you now know what's going on there as well. And you re need really little amount of boilerplate code to actually be able to uh, create this, which is cool. So thank you.
Um, if you want to see the presentation again, I've uh, added the link here. Uh, I think now we have some time for questions, if there are any. <laughs> 